Well, it really is a great pleasure to talk to one of the greats of Scottish rugby, and this, of course, is Bill McLaren. Now, Bill, welcome to the programme. Thank you very much. It's a delight to have you here. I'm sorry, sorry that we don't have as much sunshine as we would like to have, but uh, it's a pleasure to have you uh, visit, visit us. And what a beautiful view you have here. We were very lucky to, to, uh, to, to get this house when it came on, on the market. And um, we've just been delighted ever since. And uh, I always say to Bet that uh, whenever I leave here, it'll be feet first. <laughs> <laughs> because it's such a wonderful view. And uh, we've been very happy here. Tell me, Bill, how much do you miss doing these commentaries now? Because it's been five years. Oh, the, uh, I, I miss the preparation. I used to love sitting down with a, a, an, an empty full scrap sheet and uh, start filling it up with all the details of the players, the fixture, you know, how often Scotland had beaten England and and so on. And uh, so that by the time the match came along, I had in front of me a big double full-scrap sheet of of paper in which uh, I would have every single detail for the game and for the players in the game that I would need to have. And um, I, I found that that was really the best way to do it was to start at the beginning and finish at the end and, and get as much information about the players and the fixture itself as I possibly could. And um, I, I, I had a, a great love of that. I used to love sitting down with an empty <laughs> full cap sheet and um, just start working at the top. So, you know, Scotland have played England 94 times and Scotland have beaten England 94 times <laughs> and, and, and things like that. I found that that was what listeners and viewers enjoyed most of all was much of the background information that I was able to supply because I used to love researching things. And I had people who, who wrote to me and said how, how interested they'd been in what I'd been saying on, on radio and television. And so it was a labour of love, really. I mean, it was, you know, it's quite easy to to be interested in, in what you're interested in. <laughs> and and uh, so it, it was a labour of love and, and very easy. Now, your very last international Scotland against Wales at the Millennium Stadium, a very, very special occasion. What are your memories of that? Because you must have been really emotional. Uh, Cardiff was always emotional, wasn't it? Because the Welsh were so emotional about the rugby football. And I used to love going down there because... Uh, it, it sort of carried you along with the interest that the, the Welsh people themselves had for their own game. And uh, and I just used to love going down there and, and bumping into people in the main, in main street. And, and uh, you know, they, they, everybody down there knew about rugby. They knew what they were talking about. And, and so it, it, it was an education for me to go down there and uh, and to meet all those people. and Because that, after all, is what I'd been accustomed at home in Hoyk in the Borders, which is very much a rugby area. And, of course, once you got down there to Cardiff, you, uh, you really were livened up, as it were, because uh, everybody down there talks rugby football. And, uh, and it, it was a delight for me just to go down there to that particular environment, going from one rugby environment in the borders of Scotland to another down, down in Cardiff in Wales. What was the feeling like, though, knowing that this was your last ever international commentary? Heartbreak, uh, really, because doing commentary had been so much part of my life, really. I mean, mean, it was all part and parcel of the family life. Family had to get used to me uh, locking myself away and and studying uh, the details about the players and the fixture and so on. And so it was just a part of life, but it was a part I enjoyed because I was lucky enough to be born and bred in a rugby area. And the international match, a lot of people thought that was your last commentary, but it wasn't, in fact, because you did the Melrose Sevens. That's, that was your very last uh, commentary. Oh, the, the Melrose Sevens, the nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you, think, uh, when you think of it, you've got 16 teams, all different colour of jerseys, and, and some coming from goodness knows where, you know, England, Wales, Ireland, uh, overseas, with, with uh, all kinds of uh, South Africans, New Zealanders and at the Melrose Seven. Melrose, of course, is the Great Sevens Tournament, the first ever, and and um, it's it just a unique occasion in rugby football. And um, I'm lucky enough to have been born and bred in the border, so that the Melrose Sevens is a, is a kind of home from home. And uh, it's uh, it's always the big, big seven-a-side tournament to be 
to be uh, covered by television and and uh, a, a terrible examination for a commentator because uh, by the time you come along to the early 70s, you wish you hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, yes, by slogging and doing the homework, you uh, you prepare yourself for it. And uh, um, I, I, over the years, I managed to work out a formula that seemed to work for me. And uh, and so uh, I used to love the the, the, the occasion. Because Melrose Sevens was Melrose Sevens, it's special. Um, you know, you can talk as much as you like about Hong Kong Sevens and so on, but here in the borders, Melrose Sevens is uh, the big occasion. And, uh, and it's wonderful to see a small border club, um, you know, on, on the day with 15,000, 20,000 people in it. It's quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it is one of the great unique occasions in, in, in British rugby, really. But it's a test, and, uh, and it was always a great delight at the end when you, when you, you, you put the final curtain to the actual co commentary. And uh, you thought, well, thank God that's all. <laughs> <laughs> so why did you decide to quit at the top, effectively? I think you, you find out yourself. You begin to realise that you're not quite as quick as you were and that you maybe don't pick up an odd thing here and there that you would like to have done. And the game tells you, and you, you soon begin to realise that you're not quite with it. And I think that's the time to, to say, you, you know, well, I've, I've had my share and, and I've been lucky. I think that, that's, that's the way to do it. I've had a great time. I've, I've seen, some of the, seen some of the greatest players that the world has ever seen. David Campese, for instance, just as one example, and there are so many others. All the great touring sides, the All Blacks, the South Africans, the Australians, the Wallabies, with their particular style. And it, it was a, a delight for me coming from a, a border town which is rugby bred in the bone, to, to be able to study the way those fellas do it the way those fellows prepare for their games, the way those fellows prepare for their fitness. And, uh, and it, it, it enhanced my own knowledge of the game and, and, and of the way people in other parts of the world like to play it. And you quickly learn to appreciate that other people have other ways of playing the game. That it doesn't, they don't all do it like the border people in, in Scotland. And it, it's always been a great delight for me to, to study the type of style that so many people have brought to our country and, uh, and um, to compare it with our own way of doing things. So uh, that, that has been an absolute delight. And, and it, it was always a thrill for me when a touring team came here because inevitably they, they produced some aspects of the game that we'd never seen before. And we copied it. We copied a lot of the... The New Zealand, Australian, South African ways of doing things and enhanced our own game through it. And so that's been also a great delight for me. And note also how we're not the only ones who can play rugby football. They can play rugby football elsewhere in this great big wide world and, and play it blinking well as well. <laughs> and, uh, because we've had, we've had one or two tankings from over three sides and uh, they've shown us that they can play the game just as well as we can. And we soon find out that if you think you're top of the tree, you're not. <laughs> and, uh, and for a commentator, of course, to be able to study um, the different styles, different way of doing things, the Springboks with their, with their forward power, you know, and the Australians with their slick handling. Each, each country seemed to have something different to tell us. You, you have to be prepared to be on your metal whenever you uh, face a touring sign, because uh, they are hot stuff. They are hot stuff. Now, you had 50 years with the BBC, but after you retired, I understand the ITV tried to get you to work for them. Is that right? They did, yes. I, you uh, tempted at all? No, it never, never struck me, really, to be quite honest. I was always very happy with the BBC. The BBC people always seemed to me to be pretty professional, pretty much with it, as it were. You know, the, um, the folk you worked with knew what they were doing and, uh, and were, were on the ball, as it were. And uh, there were some great characters as well, you know, in, in, who, who shared work with me in the BBC. 
I, I never had any doubts at all about um, going to the BBC and working for the BBC because the, the people I found there were so helpful and knew their job, they knew what they were doing. And that's tremendously important for a commentator that the, that the support staff are with it and, uh, and are providing the kind of information that you, that you require to, uh, to keep the commentary live and exciting and interesting. And so um, I, I was always very happy indeed to be working with the BBC. And, and as a result, I've met so many cracking professional broadcasters that they helped me. To, uh, to expand my own abilities and, uh, and uh, because, you know, when you're working with good folk, you, uh, a, bit, a bit of it rubs off on yourself. And, and I was so lucky with the people, some of the people that I worked with were just so professional. Because you were uh, part of a formidable team, weren't you? David Coleman, Harry Carpenter, uh, Peter O'Sullivan, all these great names, and, of uh, course, Bill McLaren. Star, <laughs> they're stars, they're stars. I, mean, I, you know, I was just a ham and egg one compared to them. But they, were, they were stars. <laughs> Many would disagree. <laughs> Wonderful fellows. Uh, they, they really were. And, and just, just to chat to people like that, <laughs> I just uh, thought it was wonderful and, uh, because they were true professionals. And, uh, it was always just a, a, a delight to be... BBC, you know, you just used to say, I'm BBC. You weren't really, but you used to like to get on that you were, you know. So what does Bill McLaren do these days now, away from the microphone? I do the hoovering and do what my wife tells me to do. <laughs> I find that's the easiest, uh, easiest way of doing it. The line of least resistance is just to do whatever she asks. And, uh, and we go on fine. <laughs> I mean, I was happy as a sandboy. And uh, and that's due to my wife, my wife really. And uh, so I've no complaints. I mean, I've seen the seen the greatest rugby players in the world. I've seen the greatest rugby teams in the world. I've seen some of the greatest games in the world. You know, I can have no complaints if, if it all ended at this single moment. It's been a delight, and uh, and I, I thank God for the fact that I was maybe in the right place at the right time and. The commentators were, were in, maybe in short supply and, and uh, I managed to get my nose in the door and it's just been, been a treat. You can't, you can't expect anything better, you know, than to see Scotland win the Triple Crown and do the commentary. <laughs> do the commentary. <laughs> Doesn't get better than that, does it? <laughs> I'm fascinated with your thoughts on rugby as it is now because there's been a lot of changes in rugby in the last five years, professionalism and that sort of thing. Do you like rugby as much now as you did back then, or do you see that rugby is going the way of other sports, which is very professional and the fun's going out of it? What, what's your own thoughts? I think it's lost lost a certain fun element because uh, that was one of the great things about rugby football that, uh, that you know, right from the earliest days you were taught to accept defeat and, and, and victory in, in the same spirit. And uh, and and rugby people manage to do that, I think, better than most sports. I'm not I'm going into that in any great detail, but certainly, rugby players have always had to take the knocks because you, because you get the knocks. You know, you get knocked about a bit, and and uh, and also you have to take defeat in the right spirit because that's part and parcel of the of the, the history of the game. You, you, you don't complain about it. If you're beaten, you're beaten, and that's it. And you accept it and go on with the next thing. I think it's taught youngsters an awful lot about the game, and, and it's also taught youngsters to appreciate the acceptable bits of, game, of, of the rugby union game. Because there are so many of them. I mean, it's a great game. But generally speaking, when you consider how physical rugby football is, I mean, when you think of the, the the weight of tackle that is put in nowadays, you know, and how you can almost get your head locked up if you're not careful about some of these headbangers, and, and they're the ones you have to watch, the, the, the guys who tackle dangerously, because the fellow carrying the ball is defenceless. I mean, he's, you know, he can, he can drink and so on, but there is that worry about rugby union that the, the physical aspect has got to be kept in control. And referees have got such a big onus in that regard. Maybe some of them need a wee bit, you know, reminder that uh, that they have a big part to play in keeping the the level of, of not violence, but the level of of that kind of robust play 
at the right level. And uh, because because it, 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 the physical aspect has to be part and parcel of rugby football. It's that type of game. But the fact is that rugby can still be played safely and and physically, if you know what I mean. And provided, uh, as I say, the, the approach by coaches is, is right, the players is right, uh, and, and the referees is right. And if you get these things right, it's the greatest game in the world. Um, marvellous game to play, and it's a marvellous game to commentate on. And what about this year's Six Nations, which was a, a fantastic uh, ending on the day, and of course for you personally to see your grandson Rory Lawson uh, step out uh, for the very first time and start a game at Scrum Half for Scotland. You must have been a, a very proud man there, but what a fabulous ending to the championship. I was petrified. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you worry, you know, because rugby is a physical game. And Rory was the scrum half, and the scrum half usually is the smallest player in the side, and so he gets the biggest hammering. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so you're always worried about the physical aspect of it. But the thing about Rory is a tough, he's a tough little guy. He's, he's got quite a hard physical edge to him, and so he can stand up for himself. And so, so far, he's, he's done well. He's, he's, he's quite a brave little fellow. You have to be as a scrum half, of course, you know, because uh, you're, you're nearest to the big grunters. <laughs> and, uh, and the big grunters just love to get a scrum half in their mitts <laughs> and sort of work him over a little bit and, and do destroy his confidence and so on. So uh, Rory's had that to be up with, but, but he's done it very well because he's, 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 quite, a, he's quite a brave laddie. He'll drop at the feet to stop uh, a foot rush. Sails in where angels fear to tread. I've often thought, oh, he hasn't done it again. Has he? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but um, he's done well. But, but as a commentator watching your grandson playing, and particularly at scrum half, so close to those great big lumps, you know, who, as I say, just, just live to get their hands on a scrum half, that's, that's a bit worrying sometimes. But uh, you have to get on with it. What did you think of the the Six Nations Championship this year? Uh, it's uh, it's it's just a great championship, and uh, and whoever wins it deserves a pat on the back. And uh, there's no, it produces some great rugby football. There's no doubt it's special. You put Scotland against England at Murrayfield or at Twickenham, and you've got something special. And you put Wales against England and Wales against Ireland. It's a it's a very distinctive championship, and um, I hope that it'll never. It'll never change to any great degree because um, when I think back to some of the great players that we've seen in it and some of the great matches that we've seen in it, it's a very distinctive part of rugby football. Mm. Wonderful. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed reading your autobiography. There's some fascinating stories in there. But something which for me was so touching was the real life stories as well, away from rugby. For instance when you were in Italy as a 21-year-old in the war, uh, there were some dramatic events that, that you witnessed. Can you just tell us about that? It kind of takes your breath away sometimes when you think of it. And when I, when I look back at some of the things that happened and, and you know, how near you came to, to disaster at times, you, you, you realise just how, how fortunate you've been. Because Italy was Italy was rough going. It was a tough country to fight in for a start, and and you couldn't get more dangerous enemies than the Germans because they were blinking good soldiers. You, I, th- I think, really at heart, we'd rather have been on their side than, than the other way around. But, uh, but um, I think, as as in rugby football, you, you just learn to take the rough with the smooth. You have to you you have to accept that things don't go your own way. Uh, every time you you, you you want them to, that you have to uh, you have to deal with situations that are are uncommonly trying, and um, and there's, there's no better place for teaching you how to look after yourself than in a war because uh, you know you're, you're, there's so many different situations there that uh, you know you stand in a mine. I, I saw a fellow get his foot blown off in a mine, a mine. just stood in a mine and. Uh, and that that kind of thing um, makes you realise just how lucky you are and how important it is to get things right. Because um, uh, in, in warfare, if you make a mistake, it can be fatal. You know? and, 
and and you're very soon brought home to realise that fact, and uh, it comes home to you very quickly that uh, you've got to be blinking careful for a start, and uh, and and grateful uh, when it's when it's over. The war experience was a good one because um, it it made you realise just how fortunate you were to be standing and, and still moving about and able to look after yourself. You know, when I look back now and think of some of the great guys that we lost, I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, to go to war is ridiculous. But there you are, there's no accounting for it, and we, we just have to get on with, uh, with the demands of the time. Well, it was in 1947 that you met your wife, Bet, locally, and 60 years on, you're still together. What's the secret, Bill? I just hit her every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, 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 the secret is that I don't love her. A lot of people don't make it to 60 years. I mean, that's an incredible achievement in this day and age. Aye. And we just go on well, you know, and uh, it's... It's difficult to explain, but but um, the, the, when I first saw Bet, and I didn't have any doubt, never any doubt, and so I, I was lucky that way, and uh, and she's been a gem ever since. As I say, every I hit her every now and then, <laughs> and it, it quietens her down a wee bit. And, uh, we get on fine. Now, everything, of course, was, was going so well in your life. Uh, you were called up by the Scottish selectors for a trial when you were playing rugby, which was um, you know, a fantastic achievement. And of course, you were one step away from getting that elusive Scottish cap, which sadly you never, ever won. I mean, how much of a regret was that for you personally? The greatest sporting regret of my life, really, um because um, from the time, the time I was, I was a, a wee boy, really, my mother's full cousin, Walter he said, and played on the wing for Scotland, and, and I had stories about him when I was a boy. And um, I always had one great desire, was to play for Scotland once. We did done fine. I don't need 50 cups. One would have done me fine. Um, but that's, that's life. It got tuberculosis of the lung. That put an end to my rugby career. And uh, nothing you can do about it. You just, just got to get on with it. Um, take the next stage of your of your life and make the best of it. And um, and so that that when I look back, uh, when I'm old and doddering, about 114 years old, <laughs> and I look back, that will be the one great regret of my life. Well, when did you actually discover that, uh, that you'd been diagnosed with this? Just having difficulty in getting to my feet and after a tackle at rugby. I was, I was playing for Hoyk and uh, I was finding when I went down in a tackle I had difficulty getting up. I was just uh, short of puff. So I, got, I, got, I went along to the doctor and just, just diagnosed. And of course tuberculosis in those days was a killer. Mm. I mean, there was no nonsense about it. And, and that was a rugby career over and my teaching. and It was... Uh, it's a hard time. Uh, but there you are, you, 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 you just deal with those things as they come along and uh, and you make the best of them. You do the best that you can. And uh, if, you, if you put your best foot forward each time, at least you've got a chance. And so that's, that's what happened to me. I was lucky enough to be treated by a, a drug called streptomycin, which had just come on the, on the market, as it were. And... Um, in my case, it produced a miracle cure, my, my TB, TB in the lung, the big hole in my, my left lung. Nothing shifted it, but once, the, once it, uh, uh, this drug, streptomycin, got into it, whew, every couple of months it closed. You know, we talk about a couple of months, but in those days, a couple of months was... And every couple of months it, it closed further and further, and eventually the hole in my lung was close completely and I got a complete cure which was un- unusual so maybe maybe because in my earlier days I'd been fit and really fit you know and, uh, and I think that was a factor in, in my recovery but certainly the uh, and Dr. Biaggi who treated me and for whom I have a lot of regard um, he used to come in and stand at the bottom of my bed with two x-rays and that was the first one when I first came in with a hole in my lung, this was the one, the modern one, where the hole had closed, and I got a complete cure. So it really was a miracle, wasn't it? Which was a, which was a miracle. 
Mm-hmm. It was a, a near miracle, and uh, so I was just dead lucky. I did as I was told, of course, because I was scared stiff. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's easy. It's easy to do what you're told when you're scared stiff, and uh, and TB scared me. You know, because you knew you were ill, you knew you were in trouble. It certainly made you rivet your mind on what you were doing and and how important it was to get the treatment right and to do as you were told. So I got a complete cure, which was unusual, but but why was I glad? And uh, Dr Murray, Dr Biagi, people like that, just gems, gems. I presume living in Hoyk, being born in Hoyk, rugby's in the blood. Well, that's that's right. You were born and bred, really. Uh, I idolised the, the Hoyk players of the day: George Reid and Jock Beattie, Willie Welsh, Jerry Foster, and uh, I knew all about them and, and because they were heroes, they were local heroes of mine. And I wanted to be like them, and I had a great desire to be like, especially Willie Welsh. Willie Welsh was a flank forward for Scotland over twenty caps. And I remember in the local paper once referred to McLaren as showing touches of Willie Welsh. And oh, that pleased you. I remember cutting out, cutting, <laughs> cutting and pasting it up. And <laughs> I, uh, it was great. And because uh, I, I idolised Willie Welsh, I thought the world of him. And um, I, I never had any doubt that, uh, as to what I wanted to do in a sporting sense. Uh, it was it was easy, and uh, I think I might have made it. I think I, I think I might have made it because I was I was I was very keen to do well, and I was keen to learn from people. And and, and but there you are. You just, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all there is to it. And the name is not in the book. I would have given anything for W. P. McLaren bracket Hoyt and bracket one calf. <laughs> would have done me fine, just one. <laughs> but, uh, c'est la vie. but you did, of course, put on the famous Hoyk jersey. That must have been a, a great thrill for you. Oh yeah, and 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 this was the greens, and the greens are the greens. This was brought home to me very early on when I was a youngster. My father was was encouraged me tremendously. And uh, I knew all about the great players of the day, and I always wanted to be an international rugby player. It's the one big, deep regret that I have that I never managed it. But um, I had certain compensations. Like beating Gala on a few occasions, no doubt. And we don't talk about Gala. <laughs> yeah. There's been some good players from Gala, though, hasn't okay, there? Well, we don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a great respect for Gala. Hoyk and Gala are intense rivals, of course, have been for a hundred years. But um, there have been some great fellas come out of Gala and some great rugby players have come out of Gala. What about your favourite Hoyk player? W.R. Sutherland. Wattie Sutherland was Hoyk and Scotland's wing three-quarter. My mother's full cousin, she thought the world of him. And he played in the wing for Scotland. He was a flying machine. He ran in the athletics championships and... uh, and he he was something else. I was always always I was always so proud to have been related, even in distance, to W. R. Sutherland of Hoyk in Scotland. Oh, I, I would have given anything to have been like Wattie Sutherland, but then I was never as quick, and I didn't get as many caps. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just to have been related to him in that distant way was something for me as a boy, as a youngster. To be mentioned in the same breath as what he Sutherland was something. Let's turn now to um, your journalistic and commentary career because I believe you started off in, at the Hoyk Express as a junior reporter, but of course it meant that you could cover all the uh, all the Hoyk games and and other rugby matches as well. Covered a lot, every single item. I wrote a weekly column. Uh, which had to have a very strong rugby content, as you can imagine. Generally speaking, had a, 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 a super training because the editor of the Hoyk Express was a man called John Hood, who was a dyed-in-the-wool newspaper man. And um, I learned a lot from him. He was I, I owe a lot to him to, um, for the way he pushed me along and helped me to, to work out how to cut 15 words into five. Because I'm a big blether, you can, you can tell, you can tell from this interview <laughs> what a yap I am. But John Hood was able to cut me down from a hundred words to twenty, 
and yet say the same thing. They were great days. And he had BBC connections, didn't he, which really helped you? There's no doubt. He, uh, he was the BBC's rugby correspondent. Well, he was the BBC's correspondent, sending up little items of news to the BBC for their news programme. But especially, he was uh, responsible also for rugby content. And that was my job when I joined the Hoyk Express. How did you make the step from the Hoyk Express to the BBC? So there's a, a fellow, apparently, at the BBC in Glasgow who uh, suggested that, you know, they had a young fellow who might do a bit of reporting. And so I was uh, hired, in a way, to do some uh, re- report news items. And then Leo Hunter, who was a producer with the BBC, thought he saw signs of commentary work in s- some of the things that I'd done. And so the BBC pushed me into doing some commentary. It was uh, very elementary stuff early on, but but um, as I got accustomed to it, uh, I, I became the BBC's Scottish commentator. And then I was asked to do a commentary for London. And so uh, I did uh, a couple of practice commentaries for uh, London BBC. And uh, from then onwards, I was just... just uh, I was the BBC's commentator and and I eventually got sent to Cardiff and imagine going to Cardiff to do commentary first. Whew. I seem to remember being so concerned that I was actually going to to Wales where everybody knows rugby, everybody knew about rugby and where you had to be on your toes. And uh, I went down, nobody showed me anything, they just... Uh, told me to get on with it. And, of course, I was so fortunate, wasn't I, coming from a, a rugby background like Hoyk in the borders of Scotland where they sleep, eat, drink and uh, rugby football, you know. It, it was fairly, fairly easy. And once you had the interest, then you do the homework. And uh, and that was a great one for homework. I, I, I was maybe overdid it, but certainly I did as much background information digging up as I could so that by the time the eve of the international commentary came along, um, I had a great double full scrap sheet with almost every single item of information I would need about players, about fixture, about venue, and so on. And um, and then it just blossomed from there. Your style develops, doesn't it? And uh, and uh, that, that was my way of doing it. Some people thought I should be locked up <laughs> because... Uh, you know, I thought I was a bit putty. <laughs> um, but, but I found that if I did all that comment, all that uh, research work, that come the day, there wasn't much about the fixture or the players that I didn't know because I'd slogged my butt off, as they say, um, in, in acquiring as much information about that fixture and the players as I could. And I think that was one of the things that the, particularly the Welsh people appreciated about my style of doing it was the fact that um, that I was at pains to produce as much information for their benefit as uh, as I possibly could. And I always felt that that was my job as a commentator, was to provide interesting information for the, the viewers to appreciate and, uh, and to assimilate. Commentary is just the same as everything else in, in life. You, you, you put whatever you put in, you get out. If you don't put it in, you don't get it out. But it's a fact. And and uh, if you appreciate that fact early on, you're in business. And certainly I, I never had any doubt about the need to do my homework, to slog my, on the Friday night particularly, for the game, to slog, as they say, slog my butt off, uh, to get as much information as I could about the game and its players and uh, and its background. These uh, wonderful catchphrases you had, like the um, they'll be singing in the streets of Hoyk tonight, mm. was that all uh, off the cuff? Most of it. Uh, uh, the, I, I did prepare one or two. I had one or two sort of standards that were there, if need be, but uh, but most of them did, came off the top of your head, and you just had to be careful that you didn't swear. <laughs> 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 I had one dread that I might use a swear word. Uh, but I never did. Uh, I got away with that. And of course, the fact is that the commentator is dependent solely on the people round about him. You know, you can do all the homework you like, but if you haven't got people round about helping you, 
and and the, the support staff of the well, I'll talk about the commentator and the clever dicks, <laughs> but the support staff of the clever dicks. Support is the most important thing of all in my book. Tell me your thoughts on um, rugby in the borders now compared with the golden days, as I call it, of the 60s, 70s, 80s, with the Rennix, the Arthur Browns, the PC Browns, all these great people, the local derbies, which were just phenomenal, the border league matches. And now, sadly, it seems to have gone. What, what are your own thoughts on, on border rugby? I think I think um, there's nothing like the number of great personalities. I mean, you mentioned Arthur Brown, um, Arthur Brown, the Gala fullback, who uh, who causes uh, us folk in Hoyk plenty of trouble in his <laughs> day. But I mean, I mean, I was an absolute delight for rugby football because he enlivened every game he played in, and uh, and and he tilted his lance, he, he, and that kind of fellow brings a crowd to its feet. I was lucky in the borders, there wasn't, uh, you know, with people like that, because the borders is cluttered with with personalities of that type, um, guys who go their own way and uh, and and who are very likable for it. Um, you kind of you can't stand the sight of them when you're playing against them <laughs> because they're always causing you so much trouble. But but it's a delight to do commentary on them. I mean, with the likes of Arthur Brown, you never knew what Arthur would do next. And that enlivened your commentary because you were always on your toes wondering what, what's going to happen. Again, I was lucky in, in being born and bred in the borders because there is bread in the bone. Rugby union is bread in the bone. And and uh, it, it, it was it was easy to appreciate what people were trying to do. And, and there were so many personalities in border rugby, you know. I mean, the, the, the game in the borders is festooned with cocky little fellas that uh, tilt their lance and then have a go and that take you on and, and uh, are happy to challenge you. Come on, come on, you know, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And so the Borders is a hotbed of that that type of rugby football where, um, where players aren't frightened to have a go and uh, it makes it great to do commentary on. Well, you have to be on your toes. <laughs> but what about now with border rugby? Because uh, um, it was very high profile. Nowadays, of course, it's the pro game. And it's almost as if the clubs have been downgraded, which is such a pity. Oh, they'll, never do, they'll never downgrade the borders. Uh, because uh, the, the border, your border rugby man is a very distinctive individual, very strong f- views and, and, and not afraid to express them. And uh, the Scottish rugby union always have an eye on the borders just to see what they're doing, you know. And uh, and so I, th- I think that um, that border rugby is uh, has got such a firm foundation, you know, and and with so many great personalities over the years, um, it, it'll always be, it'll always make its mark, um, uh, and 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 it'll always produce class players. Because the demands of uh, local people are are that way, we, we, we don't take second class. We, you know that kind of thing. We are the borders, and uh, it's always been that way, and, and I think it always will. Now the World Cup is coming up very very shortly. Two thousand and seven World Cup. We're all very excited about that. What about Scotland's chances? Do you think Frank Haddon can get things moving for the World Cup? I, I don't think Scotland will make a great impact. I think they'll 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 play their part and uh, and they'll win the matches they're supposed to win. But the, the, I don't think we've got quite the quality of personnel all the way through to uh, produce uh, a, a final, for instance. I think that all, the, the most that we can hope for is that um, we'll, we'll make an imprint on some of the big shots. And, you know, just to, to hold the New Zealanders to a tight would be a great effort. And so there are lots of targets for uh, for for the various countries involved. You don't have to win the World Cup to have done well, and Scotland, I think, will be in that bracket of uh, teams who um, make an impact and for whom the others will be a bit wary. Do you think anyone's going to touch New Zealand? Well, they're bound to be hot favourites, aren't they? I mean, they're, uh, they're something else. Um, they're all made out of concrete. They'll take some beating. The blacks still take some beating. 
on the other hand, they're the target, and it's a formidable target, but uh, you don't believe all blacks and you've done well. Because a lot of people said New Zealand uh, were going to win the last World Cup, the World Cup before that, the World Cup before that even, and they never managed it. They always fell at the final hurdle. Amazing that, you know, when you look at the All Blacks and you look at their history and you look at the quality of players they still produce, there's something else. But as has been proved in the past, they can be beaten. And it's a question of hitting it right on the day and uh, being unafraid. Do you think Scotland's ever going to beat New Zealand? Oh, aye. Oh, well, Scotland can beat New Zealand. They've come close a couple of times, a couple of draws. Aye, they've done well. They've done well against New Zealand. It's, uh, it's, we seem to react well to the New Zealand challenge. But um, you've got to react well. Because if you don't, you get a thumping. Mm. <laughs> you don't, you get a thumping. <laughs> You've had some incredible highs in a remarkable career. Um, you've had, I mean, we're just sitting in your museum, really, uh, of tributes to, to Bill McLaren. I'm just glancing around the wall now. There's some fantastic uh, tributes in here. It, it's just wonderful to, to look at. And it's clear everybody loves you. And that must make you feel really happy that you have touched the lives of so many people. Oh, I'm thrilled a bit. And, and and I think thrilled to bits, mainly because you, you've done reasonably well. You, you know, I've done not so badly. I've, uh, most people have been very kind to me and uh, and they seem to have enjoyed the, the style of commentary that I've produced. And there have been so many people who've helped me. You know, you, you, you don't do those things on your own. You need, you need assistance here, there. And uh, so many people who've, uh, who've helped me along the way. And uh, I'm deeply grateful to them. I'm deeply grateful to my wife, Bet for, for, for putting up with it for all those years. <laughs> when you mention about famous borderers, you, you mention people of Sir Walter Scott, and very soon out after Sir Walter Scott is the name Bill McLaren. Uh, well, I'll be quite happy just to do the dishes at home and do the hoovering. <laughs> <laughs> but people want more, Bill. Don't they? they want to see a statue of you in Hoyk. <laughs> the children that I had at school, I give them a chance to throw snowballs at it. That is it. Be that as it may, but we want to see a statue of Bill McLaren bang in the centre of Hoyk. Uh, How would you feel about that? Uh, wonderful, because uh, because I love I love my home hometown. Always have done. I've been proud of it because we've got reason reason to be proud of Hoyk, and uh, and I hope it'll be, always produce reason for pride. And uh, that mugs like me will help that along, and uh, and because it's been a joyous ride, it's been a journey that I have done uh, in the, in the rugby sense has been just a delight. You know, when you think of all the players, all the fixtures, all the countries that I've been on, all the grounds, uh, all the stadia, all the crowds. You know, think of fifty, sixty thousand. And uh, you think of all the delight that has been occasioned by rugby players. It's a great game. It's, it's, it's just produced such delight for people over the years. Other things as well, uh, maybe that we weren't so proud of it. But generally speaking, rugby football can hold its head high. And that makes you proud as well. Just to be associated in a, a wee way with that, that kind of background. I've no complaints. <laughs> uh, Scotland for the World Cup would have been a delight, but um, just, uh, it was just not quite good enough. But so what? Well, look, Bill, um, in the distant future, when people look back at uh, the game of rugby and the name Bill McLaren will always be there in 50 years, 100 years, way into the future, the name Bill McLaren will be associated with rugby, with Borders rugby and with Scotland as well. What would you like to be remembered as? Being fair. I think that's the main thing. If, if you're put in a commentary position, you know, and your own country are playing, you've got to forget that and, and remember that there's somebody else playing as well. And I always felt that it, it just, be, just fairness, just treating everybody alike. If uh, that laddie from England does well, give him a pat on the back as you would you give you're a Scottish player the same thing. 
um, treat everybody alike. I think if you do that, you've done pretty well. It's not easy, because, you know, you do get biased. You do have feelings about certain things. But um, I think if you can be fair um, and treat everybody alike, you're not going far wrong, especially if Scotland were to win the World Cup. <laughs> Bill, it's been a real pleasure to spend some time with you at your home and we wish you all the best in your retirement. Bless you.